Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us rather than sitting on a beach. That's a real dedication, really appreciate it. Um, it's great to welcome you all. My name is Adam Bartha. I'm the director of Epicenter, a network of nine free market think tanks from all across Europe. And I'm delighted to have three amazing think tankers from three different regions um, within Europe here with us. So first of all, welcome to Juan Peña, who is the Secretary General of Fundalib, which is a leading Spanish think tank. Um, Juan is also a great author um, who has written quite a few amazing books. So if you would like to have some copies, uh, I'm sure he's ni nice enough to share some of that with you. Um, we also have Admir Chavalic with us, who is the founder of Association Multi, um, which is based in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, Admir is also an author. Um, he has written numerous books and papers dealing with the topic of political economy and liberalism in general. And he's also a lecturer at the University of IPI in Tuzla. And last but not least, we have Florian Hartjen in the group, who is from Prometheus, based in Germany. And he has been with Prometheus since 2017, and he's in charge of their strategy and fundraising. Uh, Florian is also doing his PhD at King's College in London, but lives in the United States at the moment. Great to have you with us, gentlemen. Um, I want to touch on a topic first that's pretty close to my heart. Um, those of you who were here last year, no, two years ago in New York, um, know that we had a panel that was a Europe deep, deep dive, and we discussed the idea of political realignment. So the idea that every now and then, the main dividing lines within politics are changing. And for many decades, these main dividing lines were based around the question of economic redistribution. You were more right-wing if you wanted to limit the role of the state when it comes to economic redistribution, and you were more left-wing if you saw an increased role for the state. So in recent times, we have been arguing that because of the political realignment, um, because people started to emphasize questions around open society a lot more than questions around economic redistribution, we were arguing that libertarians and classical liberals need to rethink some of their political allies. At the moment, I feel that this theory might be changing somewhat. Um, because of the pandemic, we have seen that a lot of people started to care about the economy once again. A lot of small and medium-sized businesses went bankrupt. Um, we are worrying in Europe, in most European countries, quite massively about inflation. So the question of economy is at the forefront again. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, gentlemen, whether you think that the political realignment, the necessity to find some new allies within the political spectrum is as valid as before, or whether we're seeing a shift once again to a conservative, libertarian, classical liberal alliance. Juan, can I start with you? Um, thank you. Thank you very I don't know if this is... I think it's... Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Um, yes, I think there is realignment uh, going on. Uh, we could possibly argue what kind of realignment we are facing. But uh, I would say that, uh, as, you, as you said, we have been for many decades, I would say since the uh, Second World War, um, in a political divide that was left and, and, and right depending on the amount of state you, you wanted to have. Uh, whereas, uh, well, this is what uh, Professor Ralph Darendorf had described as the social democratic consensus, which was, in my opinion, liberal democracy plus state intervention to, uh, in the economy. Uh, but now, what we are seeing is that that model didn't uh, work. The, the big crisis in 2007 and the subsequent uh, years has uh, questioned that model very much. And uh, what we see now is that uh, those who um, would normally uh, say that the, 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 the model was not working and we, least, we need less state, instead they are asking for more state. So I think that the current realignment is between uh, the amount of statism that we used to have or even more. And this is why um, the populisms of the far left and the far right come in, because they offer 
more statism, more control, more regulation, and they promise uh, the citizens that they will uh, get the results that the failed liberal democracy and social democratic consensus, in their view, did not, uh, did not achieve. So the new consensus is even worse than the old one. That, Absolutely. That, that's worrisome. Um, Florian, um, you have a new government in Germany at the moment, right? And that kind of proves the pro political realignment in some way, because it's an alliance of liberals, free market liberals, um, and, and social democrats and greens. So is the theory as valid as it was before? Uh, well, Adam, yeah, that's actually quite interesting for me as a German uh, because we have this real life experiment at the moment with the Greens, the Social Democrats and the FDP, the Free Democratic Party forming uh, the first, we called it a traffic light uh, coalition because it's red, green and yellow. Um, interestingly, um, before the election, they were not the best friends. I mean, whenever there was a talk show, Greens and FDP, they just hated each other. And it only took them a couple of weeks um, to change their minds completely and to draft this coalition. Um, maybe we can talk about this later, on, uh, about this coalition later. Um, if you ask me about the alignment, I think free market, the free market movement shouldn't adhere to these strict lines anymore because there is demand for policies um, and I don't, I don't want to see that we leave uh, the supply of, I don't know, climate change, environment policies completely to the Greens and to the left. I don't want to see the Conservatives completely dominating border policies. So I think we need to, more, need to be more flexible. Um, and maybe the, the great realignment for us as a free market movement means we need to go where there is demand, a demand for solutions. So we are not necessarily thought leaders. We are supplying ideas for whatever demand there is. That's an interesting approach. It, if I can respond to that, it depends on in what area in the movement you're working. When you're in a political party, you're certainly a supplier, right? We as think tankers, we do long-term social change. We don't have to worry about polls, right? We don't have to worry about too much. Too, we don't have to worry too much about current discussions, right? We can engineer long-term social change. Yeah. Sure. Admir, I want to turn to you to, for a moment because it's interesting that we are talking about political realignment in the US and in EU countries, but often the Balkans has very different kind of motivating factors when it comes to the political changes and the political structures. Um, how do you see the role of Bosnia in the future? Can you imagine a Bosnia that's joining the European Union in five, 10 years? Is the European ideal still something to pursue? Or the political motivations changed so much in the last couple of years that you want to make Bosnia free market, but not necessarily as a member state of the European Union? That's a great, great question. Uh, regarding the region, like right now we're in dilemma about EU. Like, there are no uh, clear solutions, and we do not see the clear solutions from the Brussels. Uh, right now, people are waiting, the governments and so on, for a signal uh, from the Brussels on, of the future of region of Western Balkans. Just for the audience, like, like the Western Balkans countries are a small island inside EU because the, the, all the borders are like from EU borders countries. And that was done strategically because of the Russian influence. Uh, but right now, like we see three solutions, possible solutions. First of all is the best solution, like uh, moving those countries towards EU. Why? Not because we like the bureaucrat uh, apparatus of EU, but probably that would increase the level of economical and human freedoms in those countries which are low. Uh, that solution is in the fog. The second solution that's on the table also is that we join the free market, like the open market of EU, but we do not have political instruments like normal EU countries. So the EA model, basically. Yeah. Well, that's a, like I would say that would be a synergy between local autocrats. Would, would, they would keep their local power. And EU that doesn't want Western Balkan country or Balkanization, as Anne Rand would say, like of, of the Brussels. And the third option is uh, going right now. It's really interesting. It's called Open Balkans. That's something that promoted by Serbian President Mr. Vucic. It means that they even call it mini Schengen, that we create our inner zone. 
poly of economical union, so that the goods would, would move, move across borders. Borders. That's a good idea. Yugoslavia 2.0, yeah, just a bit more pro -market. Politically, it smells on Yugoslavia, and that's a problematic for some countries. Yeah. And from a free market perspective, out of these three options, what do you think has the best potential to make the region as pro-market and as classical liberal as possible? I think definitely that the first option is the best option. Mm. Of course, if I, I was uh, as a classical liberal inside the EU, I would definitely run a campaign against uh, uh, you know, regulation from Brussels and so on, but I'm outside the EU, so right now our mission is to enter EU. Uh, but I need to be clear there, a uh, much better option for peace and stability of Western Balkan le region, which is still an issue, Bosnia has an existential crisis, we can talk about that later, uh, would be joining NATO. So NATO and then EU, like NATO is, uh, is mostly uh, like, it's important for those countries to join NATO forces. So, so we moved on to geopolitics already a bit, um, which is I think an interesting conversation to have um, simply because the influence of Russia and China on the EU is growing by the day. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts that when we are discussing disinformation and when we are discussing the rise of populism across Europe, a lot of that gets blamed on Putin and his government. A lot of the Russian trolls are going around the internet and propagating outright false or at least misleading ideas. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the impact of Russian disinformation when it comes to the rise of populism in your respective countries. Um, one, in your country, it's a socialist and uh, far-left coalition government that's running the show, but there is a very strong um, right-wing populist authoritarian party as well, with I think 15, 20% support at the moment. Um, so what is your experience? Is that partially driven by external factors or are we trying to destroy liberal democracy ourselves? I would like to mention a colleague that very many of us probably know, in the, many in the room will know, Vera Kichanova from Russia, a uh, prominent libertarian uh, there. She uh, went to Madrid a few years ago at the invitation of our foundation, and uh, she um, provided a wonderful lecture in which she uh, explained how the Russian regime was uh, actually promoting and supporting and helping technologically and maybe even financially both the pro-independence and the unionist movements in Catalonia at the time of the referendum back in 2017. Uh, does Divide it mean... Conquer, right? Exactly. Does it mean that Russia is in favor of one of those two options? No, it just means that they want to destabilize um, uh, European democracies in any way possible. And I think that this is just an example of the way they are meddling in uh, domestic and European uh, politics. The kind of leverage that they have had in past years, uh, over the past years in, in Europe with uh, the gas and the energy is uh, something that um, should really make European politicians uh, think more about becoming uh, absolutely independent from, from this kind of, of uh, blackmail. And at the same time, uh, well, I, I see that there is no hope for change in Russia. They are trying to go back to a sort of new Cold War in which uh, at the same time we have seen that for four years with the Trump administration, um, Europe has been deprived of its big brother, uh, which had been so helpful um, to uh, achieve uh, freedom over two world wars and the Cold War. And I really think that it is time for America to be back, really. And I think Europeans need uh, our American friends more than ever. Well, I think within libertarian circles, there's often skepticism when it comes to U.S. interventionism across the globe, but maybe there is kind of a fine balance to find where the U.S. can support liberal democracies without necessarily trying to engage in nation-building capacities. Uh, Florian, we, we, we mentioned Gazprom just for a second, or Juan did mention it. Uh, the previous German government was reasonably friendly to um, the idea is that we need some economic collaboration with Russia. Um, do you think that's going to change with the new government? And do you think that it is the right policy to have somewhat of an open door towards the Russian government to at least keep them around the table and try to engage with them? Or should we take a bit more hardcore line like one was suggesting? 
Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. It's difficult to respond to that because uh, the new government is currently traveling, traveling around Europe. The new foreign secretary, who is a Green, um, the former like, the Green uh, uh, lead candidate, and she opposes Nord Stream, the pipeline that runs from Russia around the Baltic directly to Germany, which is a huge issue for the area, of course, because now Russia uh, can easily cut off Eastern Europe's gas supply and still supply the very important market, Germany. Um, I'm not an expert on, on foreign policy in Russia. The thing that always strikes me with Russia is that there seems to be a lot of cronyism, right? I mean, just imagine our former chancellor, Gerhard Schröder, he is on the board of Nord Stream, right? He is the one who said Vladimir Putin is a clear Democrat and they're very good friends and he's our former chancellor. Something is not quite right when you're entangled in a way like that. Also, um, the, the populist parties, the far left and the far right, of course, are great friends of Russia, um, and sometimes even the SPD, uh, where, it, where it fits into their ideas. Um, general question, I would never close the door completely, right? Because in the end, sanctions, who suffers? It's the people. Um, um, and I don't know if they've ever been very successful. So I would never really close the door, but um, I have no clue what to do when Russia really, um, well, tries to invade in Ukraine, right? Um, I have no answer to that. True. Um, and when it comes to the kind of rise of populism and authoritarian politics, both on the left and right, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how classical liberal and libertarian organizations should be dealing with it. Because on the one hand, the argument is that if you can have some of the more right-leaning political movements at least embrace some of free market ideals, then they are, we are pushing them in the right direction. But on the other hand, we sincerely disagree with right-wing populists when it comes to societal issues, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to many other um, social topics that are close to our hearts. So, What's the right level of engagement when it comes to uh, populism, uh, at least from a classical liberal perspective? So on a brighter note, on our recent election, populist parties gained less votes and less seats than four years before. Um, so we are complaining about po the rise of populism all around Europe. In Germany, it's not rising. Um, I don't know what's the, what's the success story here. I mean, what I can see in Parliament is that, especially the AfD, the far right, um, has been ostracized um, by the other members. There's a very strict um, um, no cooperation policy with the AfD. Um, interestingly, on a federal level, uh, on a state level, uh, an FDP uh, politician wanted to become prime minister and got votes by the AfD, and he had to step down after two weeks because only he got the votes by the AfD. If we talk about democracy theory, that might be difficult to justify, um, but it somehow worked. Um, so I think the only good response to that is good governance, right? From our perspective, Juan, when it comes to dealing with some of the far-right political movements within, within Spain, should we try to engage them and push them in a bit more pro-market direction, or is that kind of a hopeless endeavor and the American experience with Trump has proven that, okay, well, you can try as much, and there were some tax cuts and some deregulatory affairs, but I wouldn't claim it was a libertarian success. I think it is 99% uh, impossible to really cooperate with the far right, uh, the way I see it in Spain and um, I would say in, in Europe uh, at large. Um, the problem with them is that uh, for several years we had thought, well, they are terribly conservative about moral and social individual issues. Um, they are nationalistic as well, but when it comes to the economy, they could be allies uh, for, the liberal, for the freedom movement because at least they would have uh, a program with less uh, taxes and uh, they would do some economic reforms uh, online with our thinking. The reality is the opposite. What we are seeing in most European countries and especially in the case of, of Spain is that the far right, this new far right, is uh, even creating workers' unions uh, which are going, uh, they are becoming as big as the traditional ones. Um, they are trying to make uh, temporary workers of the government 
uh, fixed ones, indefinite, uh, with indefinite contracts, which means uh, all of a sudden an enormous amount of uh, uh, taxpayer money going into salaries for this specific part of society, which they uh, hope to lure into becoming voters of their movement. We are seeing, of course, uh, uh, terrible positions by them in terms of free trade, and uh, on other economic issues. So um, they are not close to us even on the economy. And uh, this is what I would really like to stress because sometimes uh, some people in, in the movement genuinely, naively in my opinion, uh, believe that, uh, well, they are very bad about almost anything but they can be allies on the economy, they cannot. Sure. Admir, I think you encounter somewhat of a bigger challenge when it comes to Bosnian populists. So I know that there is a movement within Bosnia that's uh, partially supported by Russia that wants to, well, tear the country at least in two halves. Um, so how do you deal with a populist challenge from a liberal angle? Because normally we would be all for decentralization, right? We don't like big governments, we don't like big states, so if you can have many small competing little states with reasonably reg liberal regulatory frameworks and free movement between them, we would be pretty happy with that outcome. So how do we deal with that challenge of, you know, populism within Bosnia that wants to secede, um, but not necessarily uh, based on free market liberal arguments. Uh, exactly, like right now, we're in the midst of the biggest crisis in the last 25 years of the country. Like a couple of days ago, uh, one region of Bosnia, like entity of Republic of Srpska, that it's 49% uh, of the country uh, declared that in the next six months they will like stop ob uh, applying the, the laws from the uh, higher state, the government uh, level. And that's a problematic, that's like um, trying to dissolve the state. Unfortunately, as you said, like if you look at the paths of that uh, separatism from Mr. Milorad Dodik, uh, you will see that it's uh, Russia. It's backed by Russia. And right now, the, the, the leader of that movement, actually he cannot come to USA because USA banned him from coming here and he's under sanctions. Just the USA, not the EU, I assume. Yeah, yeah, but you didn't. But he's uh, traveling around Europe and finding allies with Mr. Orban uh, in Pol Poland and going to France, like uh, Le Pen and, and so on, which is really fascinating. Like it's like those, uh, as uh, Florian said, that they're just trying to destabilize the, the the region and so on of the Western Balkan and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it's really challenging from a classical liberal perspective to argue against them. I, I'm author of one uh, paper called. Called decentralization of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the curious ca case of decentralization of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I argue that yes, decentralization is uh, really good, uh, but uh, populist separatism and trying to dissolve the government just to create your mini uh, pro-Russian island, it's, it's not a good thing in a classical uh, liberal sense, knowing that all the economical freedoms and the human rights would be denied in that region. How do we fight that? Uh, it's Clinton uh, maxim, like uh, economy stupid. We're trying to uh, argue that those separatists are doing that just to cover the fact that that region is the poor, poor part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So economically speaking, like they're really poor, they have a lack of uh, funds, they're over debt and so on, and because of that, they're trying like to uh, have a populist uh, manifesto and try to make public think about separatism, then about economical issue price rises, uh, low salaries, and so on. So that's our stand as association multi. We try to say, okay, economy is stupid. Like, let's focus on economical indicators, not on the something like that's even not achievable. And I say it, uh, we will know in the next year. But breaking Bosnia and Herzegovina, unfortunately, it it's will definitely lead to a conflict, not in the size of 19th, but definitely some kind of conflict. And that's not good, not just for Bosnia and and their people, but for entire region in EU also. And, and sticking to economic incentives, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what role you see for the European Union when it comes to helping or hindering autocrats. One of the issues that we have encountered in the past is that 
a lot of the European autocrats are using EU taxpayers' money to enrich themselves, to enrich their oligarch friends, and that's how they also manage to keep their powers. Um, do you think that the EU realize that there is a problem and that they should be rethinking some of their attitudes towards some of their member states, but also potential new member states, or you know, it's part of the government inefficiency that taxpayers' money gets constantly wasted, um, and as long as there is redistribution through the EU, um, it's a hopeless endeavor to stop that. Any thoughts? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think that we really need to, to go for frugality. Um, uh, Frugal it, four, those exactly. are our favorites. Right? Uh, we, we really need that, and I think that um, it is uh, good that we now have um, uh, an FDP, a liberal democrat, Minister for Finance in, in Germany. I hope that he will be able to project uh, this kind of uh, frugal message to countries like mine, where the over-expenditure is uh, reaching uh, disastrous proportions, and also maybe to some countries in the eastern part of the, um, of the continent. Uh, but something that uh, has also been done by the European Union in recent years is to even uh, channel the funding through mayors, like in the case of Budapest, mm -hmm. instead of using the regular uh, national governments. And I think that uh, this is a good example on how we really need to go for, um, for a Europe where uh, the, na the nation states uh, are diminishing their power and they're um, exclusive uh, speaking with Brussels and the other smaller like regions or uh, towns uh, could, could step in and, and be part of the, of the game, and that would provide more plurality, at least. So proper decentralization. Florian? Uh, yeah, Juan, on the finance minister issue, uh, just today, I mean, on the first day, our new finance minister rededicated 60 billion euros from a COVID crisis um, debt allowance to a so-called climate fund, what is now challenged at constitutional court. Um, I'm not sure what this tells us about the future. Um, in terms of EU, um, I mean, redistribution and subsidies are at the core of the problem. I think we all agree this is not, I mean, contested here. Uh, we need to get rid of the ever closer union. Um, the European Union is a freedom project as long as it concentrates on the four fundamental freedoms. Everything that goes beyond that might be good cooperation, but we shouldn't force any further countries into that. So we would envision something like a Europe a la carte, where, can, where countries can harmonize, cooperate, but don't have to. Uh, and maybe this would also end the problems you have uh, with um, dictators in the East. Well, maybe if your approach would have been adopted six years ago, we still would have our British friends within well, the Union. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Admir? Yeah, I wanted to like, state here, like, uh, there's an interesting perception about uh, Brussels and EU in, in uh, countries Western Balkans. So although our trade is mainly with EU and we are using EU common market, uh, if you ask common people via surveys or members of the government, like why do you want to enter EU, it's uh, free money. It's getting you know, support from the Brussels and so on. So all the small countries in the Balkans, it's in, in Croatia, it's the same thing. Like everyone is thinking, yes, we want to enter EU because we can get some money uh, and we can uh, keep our political elites and, and so on. And it's easier if we just force Florian as a German to pay our beer consumption and that, no, <laughs> yeah, that, we don't that, need a big government. That would help. So, so that, that's generally a problem, like no one sees uh, the potential of EU market. I, when I lecture in Bosnia, I say like, you know, th because they sometimes they have a funny perception. They say, oh, Germany wants to, you know, uh, take us down economically, sell us products and so on. And I say, yeah, but we are small, small country, like three, four uh, million people. Like we want to invade EU market of, of 500 uh, ri richer people. It's not possible that they want to invade us. That doesn't make any sense and so on. Yeah, I think it's always worth emphasizing the benefits of the single market, the economic cooperation, the free trade aspect of the union, rather than the kind of monetary redistribution of uh, German taxpayers' money, essentially. <laughs> um, we have been complaining about quite a few things, but I'm very keen to kind of provide a positive liberal vision for the future, right? So it's one thing that we analyze and understand the problems, and we are trying to react to it, but how are we building the kind of positive 
new generation um, that wants to endorse both liberal policies on a societal angle and, and from an economic angle. Florian, I know that you guys are working a lot with students at Prometheus, right? So your organization is very much a capacity building organization. What is your current impression of the young generation? Are they really keen to kind of endorse progress and they, they want to build something new? Or it has the kind of Greta Thunberg, doom and gloom mentality taken over and it's kind of a hopeless endeavor? Yeah, I have to disappoint you now and complain again. <laughs> um, so this is a mixed picture. 25% uh, of first voters voted for FDP, the Free Democratic Party, which got the largest shares, share of voters among first voters. On the one hand, not a very visible group. Everybody was quite surprised that this actually happened. And major newspapers were even saying, like, what is wrong with you? Why do you vote for this party? Um, on the other hand, what really strikes us at Prometheus is that we currently see a generation of young people between 16, 17, and maybe 25 um, that lives in a world that tells them that they are doomed, right? That they are basically effed, <laughs> yeah, because of COVID, of course, right? They couldn't leave their houses for a long time. They couldn't study as we did, no first year parties. Right? But also because um, the climate change movement tells them they need to pull the brake immediately on everything um, to have a future. And just to give you <clears throat> a story of um, the lighthouses that exist for these kinds of people. Um, two young people, 21, 24, engaged in a hunger strike, two Germans, 27 days in front of federal parliament to demand speaking with the candidates for chancellorship about climate change. 27 days they didn't eat, and quite a few days they didn't even drink, because they were so desperate about their future. And at Promises, this really makes us sad and it strikes us, and we need to, as a freedom movement, we need to present another vision to these people, another opportunity, right? So Showing... how are we doing that? What, what is the best practice out there that we well, should be all copying? Well, we do. Um, re we recently started doing offering seminars about entrepreneurship, but not about technical entrepreneurship so much, but seminars where we uh, bring together students with entrepreneurs to show them how entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs are actually the source of an open and free society. Uh, in addition, we're currently shooting our video, which we won on LCL in Atlanta this year, um, together with a great team. Um, here from the US, where we also interview entrepreneurs and just show them that self-responsibility actually produces outputs, that self-responsibility works, and you don't, that you don't need the government to save you from whatever doomsday you believe comes in the future. Is the situation a bit less doom and gloom in Bosnia, where people are, you know, still experiencing massive increases in prosperity compared to the war times? So I hope that you know, people are not not forgetting how much improvement there can come within a couple of years. So what what is your experience of the youth in Bosnia? So, like, only good things. Uh, economical growth is two to three percent a year, except the COVID-19 uh, year. So things are better, but as I like to joke, like uh, you need to live as a turtle in Bosnia so you can experience that economical growth. It's not enough. Uh, second thing, we don't have cancel culture. So you have sp free speech in Bosnia. I hosted a couple of American professors at universities. You can say whatever you want against the government, pro-government, wherever you want. But unfortunately, there's a joke in Bosnia saying, yes, we can speak, but we are hungry. Uh, we don't have economical freedom, but we have a freedom of speech, so there's no cancel control. Uh, when it comes to youth, I strongly believe in two power uh, forces, technology and globalization. And it means a lot as a, for a small uh, ex-communist country, ex-war country as Bosnia and Herzegovina. Technology in a sense that youth is becoming uh, more uh, connected to the world. I see more optimism with high school, uh, high school students than students at faculties and so on. And they use new technologies and they use new brands and so on.
And globalization, why? Because it's bringing uh, West, and still the idea of West is important for those countries. Uh, I need to tell you a story here. I, when I was speaking in Tbilisi, Georgia, like I landed there, and the, the, I noticed a couple of things, and I noticed like Wendy's, you know, Wendy's, the fast food chain. And I was like, wow, Wendy's in Georgia, like, <laughs> that makes sense, you know. Like Bosnia, we don't have it. I don't know, in, in Germany, do you have it? No, like in Georgia they have it. But they told me a story like American ambassador brought Wendy's there as a strategy to distract uh, or uh, youth from the Russian influence. So it's and the, I think the, it works. Yeah, I mean, and Budapest it, had its first McDonald's in 1985, yeah, and everyone and, was like, "Oh wow, and free those, markets are arriving." So. Those things still work uh, uh, for countries like Bosnia, Georgia, uh, Serbia, and so on. We need more, more West, more uh, Western styles, culture, and so on. We, we still have spaces like we did 20 years ago, and that's why I'm really optimistic uh, regarding the youth and, and, and my country. Sure. I will throw out the microphone to your audience in a sec, but I'm also here, I'm also curious to hear Juan's thoughts on youth, because Spain experienced double digits youth unemployment for most of the time um, in the last 20, 30 years, or throughout the modern history of Spain, pretty much. Um, it has been run by a socialist left-wing government for the last seven, eight years. Um, even longer, I think. Um, so what, what are we doing when it comes to reasonably rich countries, reasonably prosperous countries like Spain that have a massive unemployment issue and that have kind of the same doom and gloom mentality that Florian already described? What are we doing as free marketeers to kind of provide a positive vision for them? What, what is incredible is that um, at all the surveys and polls that are conducted, um, we are together with Greece the country in the whole Europe with less appreciation for capitalism and free market. And this has to do with the very large amounts of uh, youth unemployment and general unemployment that, that we have. Um, one thing that uh, is uh, particularly damaging is that uh, in a country with such a high youth unemployment, the hurdles for young people to, uh, to create companies and to become entrepreneurs are pr probably among the worst in Europe. Like uh, only to start a business, they just need to pay about 4,000 euros per year, starting on the second year. And, um, and uh, they, they have no support of, of any kind. So it is very difficult to transform uh, youth unemployed, young unemployed into young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly one of the projects that our foundation is pushing for in, in Spain. So I think the problem is a cultural one. Um, when you ask young people in Spain, they will say that they want to be civil servants, if possible, and uh, their second option is to work for a large company. Uh, very few of them will say that they want to create their own business or, uh, you know, uh, being free and free or, or being freelancers, etc. So uh, th this is one of the issues where you see how culture and economics uh, merge, and uh, I think that this is a big challenge for free market think tanks uh, to try to, you know, change the general mindset about this matter. So not just focus on the daily policy debates, what can we change when it comes to government regulations, but also engage with the culture and with the kind of long-term vision and thinking of individuals, what they want to pursue in life. May I just so quickly, quickly add and then I a want very to come short to the audience note on this. As well. What is really important is that we can create a sense of belonging to the youth, because this is what we can learn from the left. This is what Fridays for Future does very successfully, ending in these doomsday visions. So as long as we can give them a home, a home of liberty, that's what we're trying to be at Prometheus, and show them an alternative path, right? They are gonna be the future decision makers that are much more free market than today. That's a nice way to transition into the other positive thoughts or questions that we might have around the audience. I know that there are a lot of experienced free marketeers here in the room, so we would be curious to hear your thoughts and your kind of feedback on some of the projects that worked within your think tanks when it comes to providing the positive long-term vision um, for European youth. But also, if you have any related questions to our panels, then I think we have roughly 20 minutes to talk about them. So microphones are in the back, and feel free to uh, indicate that you have questions. Justus. 
Thank you so much. <clears throat> there was a great discussion. Um, we didn't discuss migration that much, which might be an interesting question, especially considering the um, realignment hypothesis that you were talking about, Adam, and which also applies to the United States. And um, here in the United States, a lot of people, uh, or academics, differentiate between three narratives of migration. You have that very doom and gloom view that a lot of like the right wing of the American electorate um, on Republicans holds that migration is just like that they're a drain on the economy. Then you have the traditionalist view, which a lot of classical liberals, and in the past, the also progressives and liberals in the American sense, stuck to that it's about opportunity, finding new life, and things like that. But interestingly though, um, there's a third view now that is held by a lot of progressives and Democrats and rather left-wing people, that migration is not anymore about opportunity, but about its an obligation to take in immigrants because the West failed them and we have to take them. There is no opportunity involved, but like w the West did mistakes and now we have to take the people in. It's not about opportunity anymore, but about obligation and it's hardship to take in immigrants. And now I just wanted to know in how far does that align in the, in the European Union or in Europe in general? When we talk about migration, who are our partners now? because they are either the conservative who have the doom and gloom view about migration or the Democrats who do not have a positive vision about migration but the same thing, yeah, we have to take the refugees in because we have to, but it's not about we take immigrants in because they provide economic opportunities for themselves and for us. And just wonder, is that, are we alone in that struggle? Sure. I mean, Florian, you're doing your PhD on migration, so if I can throw the question to you first. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to respond to that. Um, concerning the three narratives, the third one, I mean, how disrespectful and paternalistic can you be as a first world country, right? Speaking about Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, the Arab world, where these people come from, where they actually want to do something to improve their life, and then we say we, we failed them? Well, okay. Um, I, I wouldn't sign up to this narrative. Um, migration is, um, policy-wise, it's, it's a terrible issue because there is actually no good partner at the horizon at the moment in Europe. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a funny, obscure situation. We have labor shortages, the lorry crisis in the UK, right? And at the same time, we're doing pushbacks. I don't know if you're familiar with what pushbacks are. So people that seek help and they want to, I don't know, get, start a better life, contribute to our societies, get pushed back. By, the, um, uh, by Frontex, which is the, um, uh, the uh, EU border agency, on the open seas. So they're trying to get help and we push them back. Um, even though we could use it, right? I mean, we need to establish a narrative where migration actually becomes um, something desired, not only for the people coming to us, but also for the so societies that host us. And what can we do to achieve this? Um, Tax it, don't restrict it, is the, is the response. So you need to get, um, get buy-in, of course, by the electorate, by the voters, by the societies, by the host countries that have, I don't know, that fear that too many people come, that they take their jobs, whatever. If you tax it, you can take a lot of these fears, right? If you restrict it, you prevent a lot of opportunities from actually realizing. So we need a new policy there, but it's not on the horizon. One, can we sell immigration as a win-win issue? I mean, Spain is one of the most tolerant countries in Europe. So. Yes, um, but um, we have also been confronted with a strong uh, push to flow of immigration uh, maneuvered by the Moroccan government, very similarly to what Belarus is now doing in the case of Poland. And um, I think that uh, it is a challenge for us uh, classical liberals and, and libertarians to be as open borders as possible, but at the same time uh, to try and uh, convince our societies exactly about this win-win uh, approach. Um, one research that we are currently conducting is about how much immigrated entrepreneurs contribute to the economy. And the preliminary results that we already, that we already know are uh, astonishing, very, very important, very interesting. Like uh, when they start a company, it lasts longer. Mm -hmm. They employ more and better than uh, native-owned uh, small businesses. 
uh, it's, uh, they are more compliant also with the laws and taxation, etc. So um, it is important for, for us to think that the immigrant is not necessarily someone who will be poor for the next 10 years and live on subsidies and this kind of uh, uh, crazy ideas that the far right is uh, projecting about them. But uh, they are a very positive force in the economy because they are the bravest and uh, uh, most courageous people uh, leaving their own countries and starting out of uh, zero in, in a new country. And this kind of entrepreneurship that they naturally bring when they come to our countries is very necessary indeed. To highlight the positive individual examples a lot more prominently. Sure. Gentleman in the back. Currency has had a mixed uh, success. Uh, one country left, never joined the euro. Um, there remain discussions about uh, the future of the euro and the governance of the euro. Um, inflation is a negative factor now that appears to be. Uh, um, some countries appear to criticize that situation, although there, there's inflation in many other countries as well. Uh, what do you see the role of the euro? Uh, will, it, will it be um, rearranged? Will it become a true common currency or will it die? Sure, thank you. Well, Florian, I know that the German Constitutional Court was uh, one of those institutions that worried quite a few people in Brussels when it comes to the Euro. Um, so do you have any thoughts on the future of the Eurozone and whether that's a good or bad thing from a classical liberal perspective that we have a common currency? I think, um, well, um, the Eurozone is at the root of many problems we have in the European Union. When you think about the Greek crisis, Greece crisis back in 2008, when you think about cross subsidies um, between countries, this has all something to do with the Eurozone. And I mean, politically, it goes back to the beginning of the 90s where the idea was just to uh, prevent a too strong Germany. Um, I don't know, maybe this worked. Um, but we won't get rid of the Euro anytime soon. Um, I wouldn't recommend any further country to enter the Eurozone. <laughs> Croatia is entering next year. Well, <laughs> you, you, you still can. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I also have no solution to that because it's out of our hands. Uh, the Constitutional Court was asked in Germany several times to comment on this and basically always um, gave right to, to uh, the ECB and to Brussels. So... Yeah. Um, Admir, I just want to say I think uh, as economists like Euro will survive because none of the country left Eurozone, they, they left European Union but uh, new countries are accepting Euros and even some countries that are not part of EU have accepted uh, Euros like Montenegro for instance they're using Euro as their official uh, currency and Bosnian uh, convertible mark is backed by Euro. Generally like Euro is having those small wins on the long term. So I think it will survive as a political concept and economical one. And, and just to add my two cents to it, maybe from a classical liberal perspective, if we accept that the euro is going to continue to exist, what we should be pushing for is competition in currencies. I mean, we just had a talk about new type of digital currencies. If the regulatory framework in Europe is friendly to um, any kind of cryptocurrency and people realize that they're gaining value rather than losing value like most fiat currencies, um, I, I think that's a positive outcome from a classical liberal perspective. If I may say, like, I think what you said is like that we are leaving the old levels like of, of these analog currencies and moving the high key and dream to, to the, you know, digital, as, as you said. So will Euro survive or not? It's not important in that sense. Well, we have current cryptocurrencies, it, it, it is. Great, we solved the Eurozone problem. Perfect. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. We solved the, the Euro problem. What about the EU? Will another country succeed, potentially? Is there a likelihood that another country will leave? 
Uh, due to time, I will ask for a yes and no question. Will a new or will any other EU member leave in the next 10 years, Florian? Yes un or no? Un unfortunately, yes. Which one? Oh. <laughs> okay, think about it. France. Adomir? Wait, wait. No, I think Eastern European countries love uh, free cash from Brussels. They're just bluffing, you know. <laughs> so no? I don't no see any country leaving soon. Okay. Right now. <laughs> Thanks. Peter. Hey. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to share a story because uh, Admir's point on how globalization and technology are reshaping these uh, poorer areas of Europe, like the Balkans and possibly some others, I think this is an underestimated thing because when you see now with COVID and how people started working remotely, um, I think that for these regions that are traditionally not stable, there is something interesting happening because globalization is now happening through technology. So you do not only have, now you don't even have to necessarily open a Wendy's or a McDonald's. Uh, a lot of people are getting jobs for American companies for salaries way above the local average uh, while being able to work from anywhere else. And uh, when you have only like a 10, 20,000 people in the country, that's not noticed. But in Serbia now we have a whole new like emerging class of people who are living this way. It's about 100, 150,000 people probably. And now when they earn some, uh, like a lot more money than the average, which is like a decent salary even in Western terms maybe for some countries, uh, they are starting to get involved on reshaping society policy-wise. So, for example, they start noticing problems that they had not noticed before, and they are feeling encouraged because now they're financially independent to actually do something about that. So if the EU or anybody in the West wants to contribute to further like advancement of the pro-freedom ideas, I think this kind of globalization should be facilitated. And then, of course, a Wendy's or another store or something like that can be there as a physical manifestation of that. But, and I also think there's going to be a trend that's going to influence immigration to the West from these countries because uh, people now do not have to move to Germany to work for a German salary or to the US. And there will be, I think, provided that these poor areas are stable, there will actually be something reverse. A lot of people who can work remotely in the West will spend some of the time living at a much lower cost in a comfortable environment of these countries, which are sometimes really nice. So Eastern Europeans will be complaining about Western U European immigrants complaining, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> that the culture is being destroyed. Right, sure. Roxana? And I think there was one more question that we can okay. take in three. Uh, I would like to know whether you think that uh, us in the think tank movement all across Europe should try and take the EFTA model and uh, apply some pressure on Brussels and our national governments to try and look more forward to that model of, uh, of association, of free trade association of the countries without the burden of bureaucracy and excessive regulations. Because we've saw that in the case of the UK, they left the EU <laughs> and joined EFTA. So uh, this maybe could be a strategy that we could be working on in the, in the next years. What so do you feel about it? Florian and then... Uh, so no more ever closer union, but yeah. deepening the single market. And yeah. one third question, and then you guys can reflect on all three of them, if that's okay. I thought it was the gentleman in the back. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, I was wondering if each of you could kind of summarize the successes and failures of how your country responded to COVID and uh, what might you anticipate as lasting impacts going forward? Sure, so three different questions. I would suggest that we start with the most difficult one, which is the COVID assessment. Um, I, Florian, happy to dive into it. Well, the response to this will be a little arbitrary uh, because um, German government is always a little behind. Was very lucky in the first summer, and then there were I don't know, congratulating each other that they were managing the pandemic so well. In fact, they didn't do anything. Um, success stories. <laughs> well, we had, until recently, until the new government uh, came into power, we had a quite a federal approach. And I think this, is, this could actually be served as a success story. Because just because case numbers are high in, in whole Germany, it does need to mean that you have lockdowns in areas where there are actually no lower case numbers. So a more federalist, a more federal approach, a more uh, bottom-up approach to that, 
I think that was rather successful and could also serve as a role model. Unfortunately, um, they s took a, a lot of powers away now from the federal states and back to Berlin. Admir, what's the Balkans experience? Uh, so we, we use Sweden uh, model, like uh, we didn't have high cases, unfortunately lots of mortality rates, but it's not because of COVID-19 and our uh, measures, but because we have bad free healthcare. So the pandemic showed that our healthcare, which is free, uh, and it's not free actually, is really bad. But I was always like, in my country, like we didn't, uh, people don't believe in the government, you know, they joke about government and so on, they have skepticism. So government didn't have the power to implement the measures, except in Sarajevo, the capital cities, and we were thinking why, maybe because of uh, foreign ambassadors, so that they would see that we do something like measures and so on. But in the rest of the Bosnia, it's like here in Miami, like no measures, and everything was fine, like in neighboring Croatia, which had measures, like identical case rates. Like that actually showed me that like whatever a country do, except two countries, New Zealand and Australia, which are really like, you know, cases for themselves, whatever you do, you will have like, you know, the waves, you know, of cases. Spain was the, less, less fair. In so. the case of Spain, well, uh, as you know, we have a coalition of uh, left wing and far left uh, currently in, in power and they were uh, just overwhelmed by the COVID crisis because they had been in power for only like a month and a half when it happened. Uh, our experience together with Italy was really horrible at the beginning. Uh, now they are doing quite well in terms of the vaccination rate compared to other countries. But uh, what I would like to stress is the way the Spanish government, and I think this is international, um, how they have been doing all kinds of sociological and even anthropological experiments on the population uh, with all this whole uh, COVID thing. Mm -hmm. All right, we have one minute left, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the Roxana model of EU development. Do you want to see an EFTA type of EU in the future and get rid of the whole political union? Florian? Uh, so so uh, I think for Western Balkans that would be a, a good idea and I think that that would solve the Balkan uh, problem because like we are really island, it doesn't make sense inside the EU and uh, for us the trade, the free trade with EU, the flow of goods is the most important thing that we can get from EU, not the bureaucracy, not the regulations and so on. So I agree totally that's a good model of introducing us and, uh, you know, selling the story to conservative right-wing aero skeptics that say that Balkan countries should never enter EU. Florian? If it means more fundamental freedoms, yes. We need to get back to the idea of the European Union and get rid of all the excess that bureaucrats developed these thousands of people there in Brussels over the past decades. Um, so I agree. I think the European construction should be based on two pillars. A very strong um, charter of individual liberties, very strong one, and really exerted and really uh, enforced, and free circulation of people, capitals, data, services, and, and goods. Uh, those two things can be done with an EFTA-like model. Uh, we don't need all the Brussels bureaucracy for that. Well, gentlemen, I will bring you to Brussels and you can introduce your thoughts to the decision makers there. I'm sure they are going to be equally popular as here in the room. Thank you so much for your, all, all your thoughts and inputs and do make sure to check out the work of Prometheus, Association Multi and Fundalib. I think they are doing tremendous policy and capacity building work. Um, so thank you very much that you have joined us and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.